I stepped into eighth grade <clears throat> three days after arriving in America. I had left Sri Lanka bruised, bashed, and concussed by the terror of a raging civil war. I had lived in a state of alert, a kind of constant alarm. My brain was accustomed to the sustained surge of cortisol, because in the midst of war, anything could happen at any moment. Now, walking in the brightly lit hallway of my new middle school, that level of fear was unnecessary. But I struggled to calm the aberrant rhythm of my palpitations and silence the fear of new beginnings. A week into middle school, I sensed the unbridgeable chasm between me and others. My childhood did not mirror the childhoods of those around me. Few could understand the trauma of war or the tragedy of death. Isolated in my own narrative, I began to feel the foreignness of America, or more precisely, my foreignness to America. In the end of middle school, I would come to realize that I had been misplaced in the special education classroom. When I had arrived at the school, I had failed my placement exam with a score of two out of 100, prompting the school to assign me with the label severe learning disability. But those who assessed me had failed to understand that at the time of my assessment, I could neither read, write, or speak English. Thus, when they had asked me for my name or age, I had stared at them blankly. In high school, I was correctly placed in the ESL classroom, but by then, the fever of self-doubt had taken root. Sitting among my peers, it became clear to me that I had lost more than friends and family in the war. I had lost an education. Compared to my new peers, I was behind in every aspect. Later in ninth grade, I would come to the realization that I am gay, unleashing a struggle to reconcile my religious upbringing with the sin of my sexuality. Being walled in by the phantoms and paranoia of secrecy, I turned to food for comfort. Over the next couple of years, I would balloon to 250 pounds at the expense of my shrinking self-esteem. Leveled by circumstance, I became undone at the intersection of multiple marginalized identities. I joined AVID at this time of my unraveling. Over the next three years, the teachers in AVID would take my brokenness and break me open to new possibilities. In AVID, I was asked about my ambitions, my fears, and my curiosities. In AVID, I felt the animating surge of adrenaline, of possibility, of a frontier being pushed outward. AVID made possible the reimagining of my life from one limited by circumstance to one liberated by opportunity, from one closed by boundaries to one opened by hope. AVID would become a safe playground for me to experiment, not just about who I want what I wanted to do, but who I wanted to become. I would go on to graduate high school with a 4.3 GPA. <laughs> By the time I entered college, the fever of self-doubt had broken. That is not to say that I trusted myself exclusively, but I trusted that my ability to succeed was equal to any other person. And in doing so, I came to understand that success is a feeling long before it's an actual result. I would go on to medical school where feelings of inadequacies would reemerge, but this time, I would recall what I learned in AVID about the power of hard work to push through seemingly unbeatable obstacles. I no longer ascribed anyone's success to talent because I knew that hard work was the ultimate talent. Now, as a physician, I bear witness to the unimaginable highs and unfathomable lows of people's lives, bear witness to the limitless possibilities of the human condition. 
And in doing so, I have learned that people are not limited by circumstance as much as they are limited by themselves. Most of us cocoon ourselves in the mediocre because we are unable to assess the ceilings of our possibilities or appreciate the infinite bandwidth of our abilities. So if we are to be truly limitless, we need to first remove the limits we put on ourselves. A couple of months ago, my husband and I went to the San Diego Zoo. When we got to the African section, we saw these majestic Maasai giraffes. At the feet of these giraffes were rat rats scurrying about. Both the giraffes and the rats were eating. The giraffes being the giraffes were eating from the tops of the trees, and the rats being the rats were eating off the ground. What I realized in that moment was that both of these animals, though they occupied the same geographic space, were eating at the level of their vision. We as humans are similar. We too eat and live at the level of our vision. Our lives can only materialize to the extent of the vision we have for ourselves. What Avid has done for me was to expand my vision so that I no longer ate off the ground. Avid elevated my eyes so that I could eat and live from the top. Today, I know this with certainty. If you are to ascend into the fullness of yourself, you need to elevate your eyes. When the ominous clouds of inferiority take root and threaten to rain on your ambition, elevate your eyes. When you feel the rumbling quakes of change pushing you to take shelter in stagnation, elevate your eyes. When the comfort of mediocrity distances you from the discomfort of pursuing your calling, elevate your eyes. When the bank of opportunity seems bankrupt and you are unable to cash your promissory note for a better life, elevate your eyes. When you feel when your dreams feel displaced, dislodged, and dislocated, elevate your eyes. When you feel beaten, battered, broken, and bruised, elevate your eyes. Today, I am changed, changed in immeasurable ways in relation to the 11-year-old boy who landed in this country. Some may say that my evolution is accidental, a stroke of chance, but I know that is not the truth. My life is a testament to those teachers who tirelessly believe that I was worthy of an education. Now, pushed atop the third decade of my life, I know this for sure. Education is less about making a living and more about making a person. Education is the elixir for the soul. Thank you so much.